So, and if, if you uh, please, let's just go around the room. We'll start with Jordan. And um, if um, Beth and Michelle can introduce themselves. So, Jordan, go ahead. Just, just introduce yourself. Jordan Dimitrikov, Harvard Medical School, Boston. Good morning, Eileen Holderman, patient advocate. Uh, Galen Marshall, University of Mississippi Medical Center. Good morning, Beth Collin Sharp from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Beth Unger, CDC. You may have to turn yours up, Beth. We can barely hear you. Beth Unger, CDC. Better? Hermes Balai from CDC. Michelle Schaefer from Social Security Administration. Uh, Christopher Snell, CIFSEC member and chair, uh, University of Pacific, Stockton, California. Nancy Lee, DFO. Marty Bond, alternate DFO. Terry Michelle, FDA. Elaine Perry, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Sue Levine, Physician, New York City. Lenny Jason, DePaul University. And Vincent Mayo Rochester. Steve Kravchik, Attorney, Seattle, Washington. Dane Cook, UW Madison. Nancy Kleinus. Nancy Miami. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to s a couple of housekeeping, and uh, and then I wanted to make a couple of remarks myself. Um, and Marty will get will nudge me if I don't say all the housekeeping. Uh, we will be getting you another um, um, menu for lunch, and so we'll, you can fill that out at the break. And then just remember, we want people to go um, to uh, pick up their food. Uh, when they come back. I mean, uh, pick up their food at lunch rather than have them bring it to us because that got to be quite confusing and you can pay for it at that time when you pick it up. Um, I just wanted to uh, say a few things. I really wanted to thank everyone on the committee and our, also our um, public participants in the audience for um, a really, I think, good meeting yesterday. I learned a lot. It, you know, this is a, a new process for me. I've never been a DFO before. I have been an ex officio on some committees, but never an, a DFO. So uh, this is a, a, a wonderful process for me to learn, and plus I'm learning a lot of content about uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, I want to just re reiterate some of the things that we are looking to do over the next few months to um, make this a smoother process. Um, so w one thing we want to do is we want, and this one is a pretty simple one, we want to establish a listserv. People can sign up for it on the website and then we will be able to send information um, to people who, who have signed up on the website, um, who, have, who are on the listserv um, in, at the same time we post it on the website. And I think that'll improve communication. Um, and so we're, we, we're going to work with our communication staff within the Office of Women's Health to get that set up. Likewise, um, b me being a fairly heavy internet user, I find the CIFSAC website to be pretty dull and pretty user unfriendly. And so we're going to work. We have some good ideas about how to. We're not, this is not going to be the go-to place for CFS, but this is going to be, we're, we're hoping this will be, because we don't have that expertise in our little office. But we, um, we, we want to make it a much more user-friendly place for people who want to learn about the committee and what's happening with the committee. So we'll, we'll be doing that over the next few months. Um, as we mentioned yesterday, um, we're going to be, um, bringing um, Chris Williams on as a part-time contractor with us, and we're very, very excited for that. And, and we, Marty and, and I have been talking with Chris now for several months, and so we are um, about doing this, and so we're really looking forward 
to uh, working with her and letting her um, one of the we, we we have to discuss what we're going to do but one of the important things I think that she'll she'll be able to do for us is um, liaison with the public I mean liaison with the advocate community as well as help us understand more about uh, the issues both scientific and uh, patient issues for um, the committee and for this community. Um, we are required every two years to update our charter and our bylaws and that update is required um, this coming 2012. So we're going to do that um, as we are required um, and so we what I think we'll, we will start with that is that we will be talking with the CIFSAC uh, members themselves and getting their input, input into that process. I am, as I said, an ex officio on a couple of committees myself, and one of them has um, non-voting representatives from, organ private, I mean, from organizations related to that, that health concern. And, um, I thought it was a wonderful idea. And um, so we're going to look into to doing that. That would require a, char a charter change, um, but we're going to see how that works. Now, we have never, um, we, Marty and I haven't been involved in changing the charter, so we don't know how long it's going to take. <laughs> we it just has to be in place by September. It has to be in place by in place September. By September. Um, so I would think that at the earliest, if we are going to be able to do this non-voting member um, idea, uh, the liaison, let me, let me say that correctly, we already have non-voting members. That's non what the ex liaison, liaison representatives, representatives from organizations. If we're going to do that, I can't imagine that we would get that done before the fall meeting, and it may even take longer than that because we have to do a lot of posting in the Federal Register and whatnot. Um, but, so please be patient with us, um, and, um, but know that that's something that I think will really um, be helpful. Um, the, um, I just want to let everybody know, as, as if you didn't already, that we in the federal government, and in specific at HHS, are in very severe budget constraints. And depending on what happens with the super committee uh, that's supposed to come out at the end of November, it could be even worse. Uh, we already know we're getting budget cuts. We're under the CR right now. We are in the hole as far as the CR. We have all canceled all of our travel. I was supposed to go to a meeting in Boston tomorrow and I cannot go because we have no money. Um, Okay, so I'll continue and we'll let y'all figure out where it got unplugged because we're going to have to figure that out. Thanks. Um, so anyway, um, we get a, th this committee gets a small, not a small, but a contribution from NIH and CDC every year for, and then we contribute um, some additional um, money. As you know, we made a decision to um, not provide live streaming for this meeting. Um, I had talked at some length with Wanda Jones about this, and what she told me was that the price for the live streaming since they began the cost had gone up a lot. It's working. There, there it right. was. I told you it was a plug. <laughs> Can you turn it off, Chris? Yep. Yeah. And so, um, it was incredibly expensive uh, in May, and we uh, just couldn't afford it. So it, while it may seem that doing the video is, should be the same, it's not. It's the internet connection and everything that really upped the price. And so we, by doing it the way we're doing, which is with an audio, a live audio feed, and then with uh, a, a complete video of the, um, meeting um, and they're doing, you know, there's three cameras and it's, it's a very nice setup. Um, we will be able to post this. It will be 
508 compliant and we hope it will be posted within the week. And so it's uh, the situation that we face. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that it will um, be a good alternative. Um, we, we are going to continue to look into other cost efficient technologies. The technology, as we all know, is changing, what, about every six months. So we're hoping that we will be able to do, um, for the spring meeting, we'll, we will be able to find some increase to increase the accessibility from what we have now. But I, I'm thinking this is a pretty good substitute given the budget constraints that we have. Um, I hope the Holiday Inn venue has worked out well for people. I personally like the fact that everybody is able to move around as they please um, and uh, not have to go through all of the checks and wear the badges and have to be followed to the ladies' room. So, um, so um, I'm hoping that will work. If Please give us your feedback on, on the SIFSAC website. Um, we, we welcome that. Um, I think, anything else? Oh, yeah, right, thank you. <laughs> what would I do without her? Um, I want to make, just thank a few people while we're here. Um, the first is Deborah Eby, who's over here. She is, um, has done this before. She is our uh, transcriber, and she will be doing the minutes and the transcription. And um, we're very glad that she's doing that. She, can, she has to come from Baltimore, as several people around here do. Um, pardon? Yeah. Yes, and, and for her and for, I've, we've heard several um, uh, requests from, uh, via email for people listening on the audio feed, please uh, give your name. And I'm going to, as the public health person who believes in, in, in upstream environmental change, I'm going to keep bugging him to, when he recognizes somebody, to use the name. Because that, <laughs> but... <laughs> but so if if him if him if he does not give the name then please do it because Deborah needs it and the people on on the line do as well. Um, I want to thank our film crew back there. They're from NIH and they have quite a setup back there. We are definitely on, on going to be on a movie. Um, I want to thank the Siemens Corporation who are our contractors who've done so much work over the last few months. Brittany, who you have seen wandering around and, and being the jack of all trade, is um, the, their lead. And I just want to thank, thank, Britain, thank Siemens and Brittany for doing that. Um, and most of all, I want to thank, because of the, their support to me, the team that we have from the Office of Women's Health. Joyce Grayson, Emmett Nixon, Ursuline Singleton, and my partner in crime, Marty Bond. So let's give everybody a hand. And let me turn it back over to you. Thank you. Uh, our, our first speaker this morning is Rosalie Correa de Harao. Uh, I'll have to say that once. <laughs> um, and she's from the uh, HHS Office of Disability. Uh, when we started to explore issues around the international classification of diseases, uh, we found out there's also an international classification for uh, functionality, disability, and health that seemed as if it may have some relevance to chronic fatigue syndrome. So uh, Rosalie is going to explain the potential for that classification system and how it might work. Uh, with chronic fatigue syndrome. Thank you, Rosalie. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, and uh, I am uh, delighted to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you uh, today. Information on uh, functional status is actually becoming increasingly essential for fostering uh, healthy people, healthy populations, and healthy living. The international classification of functioning disability and health was developed by the World Health Organization and approved by the World Health Assembly in May of uh, 2001. The ICF is a multi-purpose classification designed to provide a unified and standard language and framework for the description of uh, basically two domains. Uh, 
The first one, health, and uh, the second, health-related states. These domains, they are described from the perspective of uh, uh, the body, the individual, and the society. So the ICF uh, systematically groups uh, different uh, domains or areas within domains uh, for a person in a given health condition. For example, uh, a person has a specific disease or illness. What we look into is what does the person do or what can the person do under uh, that condition that the person has. Functioning is an umbrella that encompasses uh, all body functions and the structure, uh, the activities that the person uh, has, and participation. When you think about that, we can also think about disability serving as an umbrella. And uh, this would be then uh, an umbrella that would relate to impairments to any body function or body structure, to limitations with uh, activities or restrictions in participation in certain activities or in the uh, environment where the person lives. And uh, of course, we would have the environmental factors and uh, personal factors that affect all of those uh, 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 categories or domains. So you can see this in your slide. Unfortunately, with that light, you can't see what is in red in that slide. So, but this is an example of what we see in a patient's record when we use the ICD-9 uh, coding. So we have here uh, Ms. Harris and Ms. Brown. Uh, both are 52-year-old uh, female with uh, uh, a history of uh, multiple sclerosis and uh, they have uh, relapsing remittent uh, course and uh, they are both ADL dependent. Okay, so if I'm going to use the ICD-9 code, what I have is 340 multiple sclerosis. So when I look at those two patients, that's all I see with this uh, story and how I can code them. However, those two individuals, although they look very much uh, similar, they are very different. When you go deeper, taking the medical history, both have the same diagnosis but a very different functioning profile. For example, we can see here that one uh, uh, uses power wheelchair, uh, the other one is unable to speak or eat. So completely different. Uh, functional status. So therefore, as we collect the medical history, by using ICF, we can code the difficulties uh, with uh, dressing, with uh, moving uh, around and in different locations, with uh, acquiring, uh, keeping, and terminating a job, for example. And uh, we can even code issues related to uh, parenting relationship. We know that uh, Ms. Uh, Harris, she was a successful uh, parent. However, Ms. Brown, she did have a daughter, but she couldn't take care of this daughter, and we could code that with the ICF. So um, this, uh, this is very important to be able to identify and code in a way that will be understood by everybody. But now that you uh, got a, a little idea about what ICF is and what it could do by looking at uh, uh, stories from uh, two individuals, uh, let me tell you a little bit more about uh, the structure of uh, the ICF. So basically, ICF uh, has two parts, the functioning and disability, and the second one is the contextual uh, factors. Each part consists of various domains. And within each domain, uh, we have categories. Those categories, they are considered to be the units of the classification. So then we have uh, health and health-related states of a person that can be recorded by selecting the appropriate category 
under each of those parts. So we use those codes, and then we can add to those codes what we call qualifiers. So for example, the domains that we have include under each part, and part, part one that refers to functioning and disability, we have as domains the body function, the body structure, activities uh, and participation. And then we have uh, the environmental uh, factors and personal factors under the contextual factors. So all those domains, we have codes for those domains and then we qualify them. So body functions, they are physiological or psychological functions of the body system. Body structures, of course, refers to the anatomical part of the body, uh, and the impairments are problems in the body function or in the body structure, and could be even a, a very significant uh, deviation or a loss of function. Of course, the body functions, they have to mirror the body structure. And what I'm trying to say is that when we look at the function of uh, uh, vision, seeing, seeing has to be related to eye and to all the structures that are uh, eye related. Uh, so those body functions and the structures, they also have to correspond or correlate uh, with body systems, like, for example, cardiovascular system. When we think about uh, activities and participations that are under part one, functioning and disability, activity is the execution of a task or uh, an action by an individual. The limitation is a problem in executing that task or activity. Participation is the involvement in a life situation, and restriction is a problem that a person can have in participating. Sometimes we can, uh, those concepts of participation, uh, limitation, restriction, or activity, they can be, they can overlap sometimes, but uh, this uh, is not a major problem uh, in the system. There are chapters uh, on activities and participations where we can find the codes. For example, uh, if we are going to look into learning and apply knowledge, if the person can communicate, if the person is able to self-care, uh, interpersonal interactions, and etc. There are uh, Environmental factors, as I said, they are considered uh, from the perspective of the person whose situation is being uh, described, and they can serve as facilitators or as uh, barriers. We also have chapters under environmental factors uh, that we will assess or we'll look into products and technologies that are used by that person, uh, the natural environment, uh, uh, changes in the environment, support and relationships, attitudes, uh, service systems and policies. But uh, within all of these domains and categories and chapters, we have, as I said, the codes that are supposed to be very neutral. But when we go into the qualifiers, the qualifiers are very important because they are ratings assigned to each of the codes. They are considered to be essential because they determine the meaning of a particular code when we apply to a particular person. So, uh, for example, I wanted to look into a situation uh, to evaluate the, the nature of the change. So I am a coding that person for a specific condition, and I can say that the qualifier uh, to be used has to indicate that there is a sense of a function or there is a uh, totally deviating uh, position for that particular person uh, as relates to a body part. Or I can use a qualifier that will indicate to me if the problem is on the left, on the front, or both sides, if it's distal, uh, or I can use a qualifier that will talk about or reflect performance. Uh, 
that is about uh, how people with a problem uh, can live in the environment. Uh, and uh, I can have a qualifier that will address the issue of capacity. Uh, that means what people do in the clinical setting. Basically, in all areas, the qualifiers, they are based on the severity scale that is displayed uh, in this slide. So uh, we can start with no problem and go until a complete problem or not clearly specified or not uh, applicable in this condition. For the environmental factors, we have another scale and the facilitators, they are marked with a plus sign before the rating. And the facilitators for the environmental factors, they can be mild, moderate, substantial, and also uh, complete. Here's an example of uh, the ICF-based coding uh, dealing with uh, body function uh, qualifier. So if you look at uh, what I have displayed there, this is a situation of a 32-year-old woman presenting with a stuttering and a severe difficulty with starting a sentence or transitioning from one word uh, to another. So what you see here, body function then is letter B. That's what starts the code. Then 3300 is exactly the code for the situation that deals with the fluency of uh, speech. And then the qualifier is number three. It means that is severe, it's the severity. So it's uh, pretty uh, relatively easy and uh, to, to codify and uh, in a way it would be, it would make it very easy to, into the system to compare uh, uh, data or to evaluate data in this way. Here's another example, a little bit more um, uh, complicated. This is the code for a person that has a balance difficulty. The person has problems walking uh, on different surface and the person is not able to perform her job uh, the way that we would uh, expect. So we are talking about activities and participation. This is letter D. So D is the first code that we use. And then we have 4502. This is the code that deals with walking and uh, on different surfaces. And then we have four qualifiers. We have uh, uh, the first qualifier that talks about the, the current performance uh, that the individual has. Uh, and it's uh, number two, it's considered to be moderate. And then we talk about qualifier number two uh, that talks about capacity without uh, assistance, was in this case labeled as mild. And then we would have another qualifier that could uh, address the issue of capacity with assistance, but it's not specified in this case or a fourth qualifier that would uh, address performance without assistance that is not uh, applicable uh, in this uh, uh, situation here. But it's just to give you an idea on how much can be done with those codes and qualifiers. And here's an example uh, in which we could assign some ICD-9 codes and ICF codes just based on the information available or collected. We have uh, uh, two histories here of uh, uh, individuals who are deaf uh, and they are using uh, hearing aids. They one, uh, Both of them actually are high school students uh, living uh, with a family, but we could use uh, in this case, uh, clearly, uh, codes that would facilitate our understanding. And um, if we continue to go deeper into those two individuals, we would get additional information related to the uh, environment, the functional status and the environment. If you pay attention, uh, those codes that I am using there, they start with letter D, that uh, means we are talking about uh, activities and participation. So we can uh, look into uh, the use of formal sign language messages uh, like uh, D320, uh, this is the code. We can look into reading, informal relationships, the ability of uh, uh, expressing with nonverbal uh, messages, community life, recreation, etc. 
And uh, if we still continue looking into the environment, now we are moving into other issues that will look uh, uh, into support and relationships, uh, particularly with immediate family uh, attitudes, uh, with the neighbors, with community, with the peers, uh, communication uh, service and systems that the person can use. And if you look at those codes, they start with an E. They are specifically related to the environment. There is one code that we can use for individuals who use device. We still don't know if those codes are useful or what exactly is the meaning for those codes. But the bottom line is that we think that at system level, uh, ICF could do a lot. ICF uh, uh, codes and categories can provide a universal framework for selecting categories for needs assessment. And when we uh, assign ratings to the, those codes, we can determine the depth and the breadth of the need uh, according to the categories that uh, we are uh, using. Uh, we can also track a uh, person's performance, ability, the functional capacity uh, through use of relevant ICF codes and their qualifiers. And we can provide a, a record of, of change, for example, that uh, may occur in the course of uh, the uh, condition or an intervention that the person may be submitted to. Also, by assigning qualifiers to the ICF codes, uh, we can examine the impact of uh, different interventions across a range of functional uh, categories. For example, if a person A uh, receives a, a specific treatment uh, because of a stroke, and a person B receives a different treatment for the same type of stroke, what we can do when we look into those codes, we could uh, uh, evaluate which intervention had the greater impact on functioning by uh, determining, actually, the degree of change that has happened uh, over time and uh, what is the, the, uh, how, how deep or how broad is, is that uh, change. So it's, it's a very good application of, uh, of uh, the ICF. Also, with the resource allocation, we could say that uh, the example that I gave you of those two women who had, in the beginning, multiple sclerosis, is, I think it's a perfect illustration of how additional knowledge about functioning can help to determine uh, which of the two individuals uh, who have the same ICD diagnosis would benefit from additional interventions. And uh, finally, I could say that the ICF uh, for the electronic records is very important because uh, the ICF is composed of uh, alphanumeric codes and, and ratings, and uh, it would be very, very easy and very straightforward to incorporate uh, these into electronic health records. And uh, I think um, it would uh, provide a lot of information just with those codes and uh, easy to evaluate uh, a number of uh, individuals and uh, determine what's going on, where are the gaps and what else could be done. Well, now that you know the, the ICF, let me briefly, uh, and I tried to be brief because it's very complex, but you needed to understand what the ICF is about. So now let me tell you what's going on. Uh, with the ICF, and uh, uh, I hope you, get ex you got excited about uh, the possibility of using ICF, but I, I must tell you that it's not adopted by the United States so far. But let me tell you what is going on in terms of work. Uh, primarily, most of the work has been done so far by the Washington Group on Disability Statistics. This group was formed in 2001 as a result of the United Nations uh, International Seminar on Measurement of Disability. Uh, this seminar took place in New York and uh, it was recognized at that time that uh, the uh, statistical and methodological work was needed at an international level in order to facilitate data comparison on disability cross-nationally. 
So then uh, the United Nations then uh, invited CDC, National uh, Center for Healthy Statistics, to launch the first meeting of this group. Uh, the group developed a set of questions for use on national census, uh, for gathering information about limitations in basic activity uh, functioning uh, among national populations. Uh, to my knowledge, those questions have already been tested, uh, so they are ready for implementation um, everywhere in the world, what means that we will be able now to compare populations that are living uh, under different conditions, <coughs> under uh, different culture. And this is a major uh, advancement. In 2007, I must inform you too that the uh, Institute of Medicine uh, came up with a, a report and uh, they uh, proposed using the ICF as the tool for classifying healthy status among Americans with disabilities in our health and social service system. And of course, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, the report, the IOM report says that the National Center for Health Statistics, the US Census Bureau, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics and other relevant government uh, units involved in disability monitoring, they should adopt the ICF as their conceptual framework, and they should actively promote continued refinements to improve the framework's the scope and the utility for a disability monitoring and research. And uh, certainly, this means that ICF then should play a larger role in uh, our federal disability statistics system, CMS, Veterans Administration, Social Security Administration. So we hope uh, that this uh, will happen one day. The IOM committee was also very careful and they pointed out uh, some weaknesses in the, in the ICF system. It's not a perfect system, but uh, there is nothing perfect so far that we have. Uh, so, and they recommended, for example, that we need to incorporate quality of life into the system, that we need to develop classifications for personal factors, which all of those things are ongoing. Uh, we need to incorporate, for example, secondary uh, health conditions, very important for people with disabilities. So, uh, this work is ongoing, and uh, in, the, uh, in the final thoughts in its uh, report, the IOM uh, states, evidence continues to grow that disability is not uh, an avoidable consequence of injury or chronic disease, but results in part from actions that society takes, both in the public arena and in commerce and other private domains, and this report argues that American society should take explicit responsibility for defining the future of uh, disability in this country. How it does so will reflect the country's deepest values. Very important uh, point. Disability affects everybody or will affect uh, everybody in the course of their lives to a small or a greater extent. So this is particularly true as we grow older, the whole world, and we face a considerable increase uh, in chronic conditions and uh, uh, actually multi-comorbidities. Social Security Administration, my colleague from Social Security is here. Uh, it's not my intent to talk about uh, uh, what Social Security is doing in depth, but I should tell you that, uh, to my knowledge, uh, the Social Security Administration is very much interested in ICF and has been awarding some funds to Stanford University. They are doing some work in terms of uh, uh, coding uh, using the ICF uh, uh, codes and matching with the codes that the Social Security Administration uses. And this is very important, the work that they are doing, because if you think about from 1998 to 2008, the Social Security Disability Insurance Program, the applications rose from 1.2 million to 2.3 million. 
and uh, exceeded 3 million in 2009. Um, these are large growing numbers, so any changes that we can make into the system, even if it's small in processing disability applications, uh, may reduce uh, the time, the processing time, may lower the costs, may improve performance uh, of uh, the disability programs. So it's a very important step that uh, the Social Security Administration is taking. And of course, there is uh, some work ongoing at NIH, and I think, uh, I'm not sure, but I believe it's linked to what uh, the Social Security Administration is doing. NIH is looking into the informatics and uh, the use of ICF or the ability of uh, capturing uh, function. So the authors of uh, this paper was published in, in February of 2011. They reviewed the gaps between contemporary models of disability and how the Social Security Administration defines and operationalizes uh, disability. They looked into measurements of human function using informatics. So basically what they are using, uh, uh, the IRT, uh, CAT technology, the item response theory, and uh, it's a little complicated, but just to give you a very uh, brief idea, for example, this is a, a, an artificial intelligence software. So you start with a question about uh, the functional status and the person responds. So the system, the software will continue to work and come up with additional questions based on the response that the person uh, gave. So it's a very interesting approach. Uh, finally, I, in terms of federal agencies, I wanted to tell you about the Department of uh, Defense. Uh, last October 12, we uh, saw that the Department of Defense, they released uh, a request uh, for uh, proposals. It's an investigator-initiated awards. Uh, in the value of 1.1 uh, uh, million. The application deadline is for March of 2012, and they hope to award by June of 2012. Basically, they are looking into ICF-related products in new clinical functional assessment uh, tools. The main goal is really to determine if the establishment and standardization of a common language for clinical functional assessments will improve uh, automated disability coding uh, and workflow within uh, a health uh, information uh, system. So it's pretty important, uh, uh, the work uh, that uh, they will be doing. I wanted to let you know that uh, there are countries that are using this system, for example, to code other adults' care and service, like uh, Japan, and uh, there are other uh, applications used by uh, uh, governments, by foreign governments. I just wanted to highlight here that Australia uses the ICF framework for its national classification of, of health and fu uh, functioning. But uh, I think uh, one of the things that I need to address here, and you probably are waiting for me to say something, what about ICF and chronic fatigue syndrome? Are there any studies? And I regret to tell you that uh, no. Uh, the literature is very limited, and uh, it's basically the focus is on fibromyalgia or chronic widespread pain from the perspective of fibromyalgia. But we could benefit from this experience. So uh, one of the first studies that I am showing here was published uh, recently, and it used 256 uh, participants, and they concluded that by using ICF, it is possible to construct a sound uh, uh, clinical instrument based on ICF to measure functional status, to assess, monitor body functions, activities, and participation. This was conducted in Germany, and basically the focus is fibromyalgia. And then there is a, a previous study in 2009 that also looked into fibromyalgia, but specifically they looked into chronic uh, widespread pain from the perspective of fibromyalgia. They only look at uh, uh, 33 uh, individuals, 
but they concluded that most ICF categories uh, they could be confirmed from patients' uh, perspective. So in view of the paucity of studies, uh, validation studies that is still needed uh, in uh, chronic fa uh, fatigue syndrome, of course, they need to begin. And uh, I just wanted to, to say that uh, the ICF has the potential to provide a reliable, valid, uh, clinically meaningful description of the functional status. Uh, provide a more rational and more meaningful basis for conceptualizing treatment uh, needs, allocating resources and uh, assessing outcomes. Uh, it will um, it has the potential to encourage consideration of uh, social, cultural and other environmental uh, factors as well as biomedical factors uh, when we are developing uh, interventions or strategies. Uh, has the potential to enhance communication and encourage collaboration during the planning and uh, the, of a treatment. Uh, it will facilitate communication among uh, uh, health professionals uh, and those involved in the care planning, including uh, families and caregivers. But we need demonstration projects among fe uh, federal payers that uh, uh, could try to align ICF coding with various data infrastructure requirements in our system. So this is what is going on regarding ICF. Uh, and I thank you for this opportunity. But Nancy has asked me to just briefly mention to you what is going on now with a health reform. Uh, under Section 4302 of Health Reform. Uh, this is important information. Uh, Section 4302 of Health Reform uh, deals uh, with uh, data collection, analysis, and quality, and of course, reducing disparities. So what we are doing now under this uh, section, the first uh, uh, the provisions, the first provisions that we had to address they dealt with the uh, establishment of uh, standards uh, for data collection on disability status. I can tell you, this is only, the slide has only the language of the provision, but those are the standards that were established and uh, released a couple of weeks ago, approved by the secretary. Uh, it's a series of six questions that we will address uh, uh, functional status. Uh, they are not yet the best, but it's uh, our way to get started. That means that every federal uh, survey or data set, uh, we have to incorporate those questions in a way that we will be able to uh, evaluate uh, what is going on and compare uh, our data. So this will take place sometime in the next uh, uh, year or so. And uh, there is another component for uh, Section 4302, and I am responsible for that component. We have a small disability working group. Uh, we are asked under this uh, provision to develop survey questions that we will assess the physical accessibility of medical settings, uh, the availability of medical equipment that is accessible, and uh, the training of providers on disability awareness. We have so far, our group has developed a set of questions. And currently, those questions are with the National, um, uh, National Center for Health Statistics uh, at CDC, uh, just for them to review and uh, uh, try to reword them and frame them in a better way. And we will be deciding in the future, the secretary will receive our recommendations and we'll make a decision when uh, and how those questions will be implemented. I think this is very important because it may collect information that is relevant for chronic fatigue syndrome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Rosalie. It's very informative. I, I was particularly interested in this topic given that, that we do a lot of work in disability, uh, and it seems a system that, that is <coughs> not disease-specific, not illness-specific, but perhaps more importantly, it does not seem to have an illness bias either. And so I'd be interested to hear what the rest of you have to say. I see Lenny and then Steve. So Lenny Jason, followed by Steve Kraft. 
ex extremely helpful presentation. I recognize with item response, you don't know exactly how long it takes to complete um, any particular um, survey, but could you give us an example of approximately how many, how much time it takes the average person to fill this out? And that, that has some bearings with our patients because they, of course, have limited energy. And, and the second question is, are these items available that we could get access to and potentially put on a website like REDCAP so that it could be used by multiple investigators? And third, and most importantly, you mentioned Social Security, you mentioned your agency. Would either Social Security or your agency be willing to fund a pilot study, particularly in this particular area, that has not been studied so that we could gather some basic data? Those are my three questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And all the questions are difficult. <laughs> but uh, uh, so let me get started with the, the, the issue of time. And of course, it will take more time to assess patients. It's difficult for me to tell you exactly how much time one would spend with a person because it depends on the complexity of, uh, of uh, uh, the clinical uh, situation of uh, the problems that the individual may have. But of course, if you are going to implement uh, the ICF, you need to have a structure. You need to have a team that is prepared to work and make the process easier. So uh, I can tell you that it would take uh, more time than it takes right now uh, to go over a, a situation with a, uh, an individual. Uh, in relation to the availability of the information, yes, it is available. This is the book, the ICF book. Uh, you have it uh, online. You can uh, access. I will be glad to send out links uh, to the ICF uh, if uh, needed. So you have all the information that you need here, but you should be aware that the World Health Organization and other groups, they continue to work to improve the system. It's my understanding that they are working now, the World Health Organization, on the uh, ICD-11, uh, uh, that they keep saying that will be released in uh, 2015. Uh, I believe we may have some delays, and uh, uh, my understanding is that the ICD-11 may incorporate some of the sections that we have here in the ICF. Not sure yet, but uh, so you need to know that. Um, as uh, relates to a pilot project, uh, you know, I would love to see uh, any of the federal agencies uh, to do that, and particularly what I would love to see is uh, HHS in partnership with uh, the Social Security and uh, other federal agencies, including the Department of Defense. Unfortunately, we are in a time right now with a budget constraint. I don't see how this would be feasible. However, I believe that you as a group, as a committee, you could advise, you could recommend to our secretary and to uh, secretaries of other agencies, perhaps, uh, they, this recommendation could be shared, uh, that a pilot project be initiated. It's a validation study. It needs to be done. It has not yet been done internationally. There is a lot of work internationally in Italy, in Germany, in many other countries that they are looking into chronic conditions. They are. Uh, uh, coding those chronic conditions with ICF and obtaining uh, very good results. Uh, but uh, validation, uh, validation study, a pilot study, would be uh, an excellent idea to pursue. Steve Krafchick. Thank you. I, I am very impressed by what's going on. The, the, the structure that you have is it's the first time I've seen it, so it's very impressive. And I work representing people who have disability claims in various systems. Where would you put um, in the current classification something like post-exertional fatigue? Uh, does it fit anywhere? I was looking at the qualifiers where it might be something that would be added. And also, um, it might be that, that of those data set questions that are asked in every uh, disability context, you would add something to the extent that would seek information on post-exertional fatigue, such as do you find that activity on one day forces you to curtail activity the second day? There's nothing there to capture that, and I think with the numbers of people who have both fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome 
who are uh, disabled, that would be an important area to add to the data set. Absolutely. This is a very important area. And one thing that I could say is that uh, all the, the clinical studies that are ongoing throughout uh, uh, Europe and, and other uh, countries, uh, when uh, the validation is not perfect, that's what they recommend. And, and that's what this is about, because this was created, and it's still, it's a process, it's an ongoing process, it never stops. So one of the, the pilot uh, study, for example, if we are able to conduct one here, this would be an area that uh, could be seen as a gap and a recommendation for an addition, like the IOM has recommended numerous improvements to the uh, ICF. So um, I think that, uh, uh, this is a perfect uh, uh, question and concern, and uh, uh, that's why we need uh, those studies to uh, get started. Yeah, what happens a lot in the United States is they use the AMA guidelines, which have, uh, are not as powerful as what you're describing. Right. Would be the diplomatic way to say it. Exactly. Uh, Nancy Klimas and then Susan Levine. So I'm trying to, to get a better handle on this. In, in operationalizing an ICF in a, in a clinic setting, there's self-report forms and interviews. It's, a, it's an interactive process, or it's a patient. Can you do this with self-report forms? Uh, no, I think it's an interactive process. Because uh, if you think about there is a, uh, at least for, uh, for certain components, uh, perhaps you may do it uh, with a patient answering. But uh, there, are, there is a need for an interactive process because when you look into uh, certain uh, questions uh, that are asked for you to uh, get a better idea on what are the limitations or what are the restrictions, uh, you may need to be part of it so you can see. And uh, the bottom line is you are going to say, well, uh, it may be a little subjective. But it has been always subjective. Right. Even so, when, but, but is it, in the end, a clinician score? Or is it a, a I'm just, I mean, they're, they're different. Like, we have structured interviews. For in, psychiatric interviews are often many different types of ways of coming at psychiatric diagnosis through a structured interview. Um, this sounds like it's sort of a combination of self-report, like SF36 and scores like that, plus a clinician or an assessor's perspective. But even in your examples where whether or not those girls could date or not based on their impairment, I mean, that's probably less of a, more of an interview format. It's more of an interview format. And you will need to have uh, uh, the health team uh, trained uh, to do so. And everybody in, in, the, in the team has to be able to understand the system to be able to help and do do the work. It just infers it's, a team, you know, that's the problem. Most, most clinical sites don't actually have teams. They have, have a provider. Yeah, if you don't have a team, then you use the provider. But if you have a team, all have to be trained to be at the same page, at uh -huh. the same level. So. I, it, it seems to me if it paralleled the social uh, security blue book, it would need an, an evidence for the for the evaluation at some point. So there would be accepted evidence to indicate the level of, of disability. Is that, is that correct, I given? Maybe Sorry, um, Susan. This is Michelle Schaefer. I, I'm from Social Security. I think I could explain a little bit about what we're doing. What Rosalie is talking about, this ICF and the CAT stuff, is very cutting edge. This is very uh, new to um, the United States. And so um, we're, we're just working on this right now. Uh, what we're doing right now with um, our contract that we have um, is um, we're trying to look at a computerized version of this to where maybe we wouldn't have to have a team all the time. And it's sort of like um, taking the GMAT, if you know anything about taking those kind of tests where they ask you a question. If you get that right, then you get a harder question. If, if you get it wrong, then you get an easier question, and then they see if you can move ahead. So that's the kind of thing we're looking at right now um, at, in an internet thing. Now, we haven't, we're trying to test it. It's not, it's not developed, and we don't know if we can use it by itself. It may need a team we don't know yet, but that's what we're looking at. 
And um, we're looking at people's level of functioning. Um, when I uh, sat in on a presentation for this contract, they were telling me, well, we're looking at things like, can you pick up a dime off the floor? Can you use your hands in a certain way? And they ask them ordinary questions that, you, you know, can you reach overhead? Can you do certain things? And so those are the kind of questions they're asking in this kind of thing. And that, um, that explains a little bit about what we're doing with our, our contract. And we're still testing it right now, but hope, hopefully that helps to explain it a little. It, it will take a long time for, for this to, and, and if it works, it would be wonderful. But in the meantime, whoever is willing to use ICF, you need to use as a provider, or if you have a team, you do need to provide uh, the training for everybody to be able to, to do it. Uh, Susan, and then did you have a follow-up, Nancy? Yeah. Uh, Susan Levine, New York. Uh, I see a lot of patients on disability with chronic fatigue syndrome, and I'm frequently aware that the other providers who are part of this uh, patient patients network of physicians are not so up to speed in terms of filling out disability paperwork. Um, it, it seems to me that this could provide, you know, you could provide a tutorial uh, potentially a website where some of these physicians who are not so knowledgeable about how to fill out disability paperwork could, could go. Um, secondly, I wanted to know in, in where you've already applied some of the, uh, the, this um, type of testing in Europe and other places, how frequently will pay, uh, is there, are people reevaluated every year or reviewed every three years or how does that work? How frequently is this process apply? Do you check in on patients to see if their status has changed? And um. uh, Yeah, I think this is part of the process. Every time you see a patient, the patient comes back to you, you need to do another assessment. If there is a change, you need to reflect this with the, uh, the codes. And, and this is the beauty of those codes. You can uh, uh, clearly uh, detect uh, changes and, uh, you know, uh, be better prepared to provide additional uh, treatments. Uh, so yes. Remember, it's more back to Michelle then. If, if you're trying to do an early demonstration project of some sort with ICF and Social Security, would you be interested in trying it in this complex population? It would be a good test group to see how sensitive the measures are. This is Michelle. I, I think that it would be uh, very helpful to work on ICF. Right now, we, we have the contract with the CAT tool, and we've been working with that. And we've been thinking about the ICF, like, like, um, you know, like the IOM recommendation and everything. We've been thinking about that uh, and trying to operationalize it, but we haven't got far enough to where we have like the demonstration project yet. I mean, we don't have that yet. So that, that might be something that maybe, as you suggested, we have maybe other um, other entity, other government agencies. Uh, Nancy, Steve, and then Lenny. There you go. I'm pressing the wrong button. This is Nancy Lee. Um, the I just want to say there are many. I'm a nosologist, sort of, and a data collector, and this is an excellent example of something that ha would have many, many uses. And I can see that researchers right now this in the U.S. designing research around disability of their clinic population or of their, you know, chronic fatigue syndrome or, uh, you know, cancer survivors or whatever, this would be someone else has already come up with a framework for data collection that I think would you know, so it, it, to me it has many tools, disability determination, but also research, clinical assessment, et cetera. And just the other piece of information is I did not know yesterday until Donna Pickett was here that this is also in her shop. So she has two responsibilities, ICD and um, the ICF. One of the areas that is also very important, I think it would be very useful uh, in um, health outcomes research. So, I'm not only a lawyer. Steve I, 
So this is Steve Kravchik. I'm not only a lawyer, I do have a master's in public health, reaches back quite a few years, but the research potential of this is, is incredible to me. If you have the pilot program going on, can you add some questions or some areas that would begin to tease out the post-exertional fatigue aspects of these more complex diseases? Because it's easy to ask somebody, can you hear, don't you hear, can you pick up a dime? Can you not pick up a dime? Uh, but to tease out how you would ask the question and get at that whole area, I think is very important to this population as well as others. I, I wrote down uh, that, and I'm, I'm going to bring it. Oh, I'm sorry. Me? Yeah, yeah. yourself. Oh, Michelle Schaefer. Uh, I, I did write down your question. I'm going to bring it back and see if, if they have anything like that. Because, you know, I, I went to the presentation. I'm sure they didn't go through every question that they have. So I, I'd like to see if they do have that. And, and maybe even if they don't, maybe I could suggest it. Yeah, I would be surprised because most people don't think of that until they've worked with the population of chronic fatigue patients or fibromyalgia patients. But I think a little thought into that, you could add a couple pointed questions and you would get some powerful data. Thank you. And you know, I think when you designed the pilot, uh, you already know that there is this gap. So those questions so then can be incorporated. And uh, as a result, not only you are validating what uh, the ICF already has, but you are proposing that those questions that are already tested uh, could be added to the ICF. Well, I was looking at your, your, your um, data standard for disability status, and uh, all those questions are good. It would help if there were one or two more that would begin to tease out how many, how many of the people who are subject to the data are, have, have problems with post-exertional fatigue. Well, one of the things that I, I can tell you is that, uh, as I said, this is just a set of six questions. It's just to get started. It's very expensive to add too many questions to a survey. So what we are doing right now, I have right now a bank of questions that uh, everybody that has questions, they keep sending to us. And even our working group, we were able to develop many, but we needed to be selective. So any questions that we feel are important, just we need to collect. And uh, the idea is that we will always go back to those questions and try to uh, incorporate those questions in the future. Yeah, believe me, I understand that. But you have a question, do you have serious difficulty walking or climbing stairs? So you're gonna get a lot of people with chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia saying yes, but you won't know whether they have a broken leg or whether they're paralyzed or whether they have one of these other conditions. Whereas if you would add one or two more questions to it, you could tease that out. And you're looking at populations with, with uh, who, who have millions of people involved. Absolutely, so this I think is the plan to improve those questions. So it's Lenny Jason, Nancy Klimas, Susan Levine. Um, just because this is so exciting with this um, new material that we're learning about, and because of what Nancy Lee and Nancy Klimas have said, um, as well as Steve and others, um, it seems like we're at a critical time point with this instrument and that there's a lot of excitement. So um, I'd like to make a recommendation to the secretary that um, we ask for a pilot project in this area that can be designated to one agency, potentially Social Security. Um, but that, I think this is the time for us to get this thing going and to really move to this next step. So that's my recommendation. Chris, if you could have anyone second it, then I, we can- I would second it. Oh, sorry. Uh, a recommendation made by Leonard Jason uh, and seconded by Steve Kravchik. Uh, is there any further discussion? At the risk of Galen Marshall, at the risk of being a naysayer, uh, it's, it, it's, it's pretty vague, Lenny. And uh, it may fall into the same trap that many of our other vague recommendations have made. I think we need some time to think about it, to flesh it out. And Nancy, correct me if I'm wrong, there's no rule that says we can't make a recommendation at a time outside of the specific meeting. Is that correct or incorrect? Well, except for we have to 
if y'all are going to vote on it, you have to all be together, and then that gets to be the problem. Because when we have the whole com committee together, um, no. what I was going to suggest is we have an afternoon this afternoon, and maybe you could talk about it more this afternoon. And that's really what I would like to see is us have a little bit more time to discuss it and flesh it out so that the recommendation is specific and not general. And in the form of what Lenny said, it's fairly general. I, I, I just want to say we have trouble convening the entire group um, off -site, outside of an, an open meeting because of the FACA rules. Uh, Chris? Chris? So, I, I, Eileen Holderman. Um, are, are, is SIFSAC allowed to meet um, by teleconference and vote? Does that count if everyone's present? That's an, it's not an open meeting then. If all of us were there, if Wait, everyone Because these there? people can't be there. I see. Chris, I, I would, in, in light of what Galen said, I would offer a friendly amendment as the second that it be focused on looking at post-exertional fatigue, ways to measure the post-exertional or identify post-exertional fatigue. Do you accept that friendly amendment, Lenny, or do you want to withdraw the motion and we'll discuss it at lunchtime? What, what, because, because of the time issue, and I know that you have other agendas and you're already past the time for this allocated time, what I would suggest, I'll go along with um, Galen and, and we'll bring this up this afternoon. A little out of time, and I'd, I'd got a Nancy and, and, Su and Susan. So if if they're really really important questions, yeah, ask them quickly. <laughs> this is a, a question about the system, because it matters to all these other discussions. If, uh, we have a serious problem just coding the diagnosis of our patients, and then it's in transition, and in, in your office even. But the um, what, how does this thing work with multiple diagnoses, many ICD 9, 10, 11s attached to it? Um, I'm just curious how you data track if people, if, if people's severity, if someone has a, a neurologic ICD 10 code tucked into their chronic fatigue code, tucked into a sleep code, tucked into a pain code, how does, how does that work and how do we, um, re how do, is it possible to link things to the various codes? Well, that's a challenge, and I think uh, we will need to learn together. Uh, and just to give you an idea how challenging things are, uh, the American Geriatric Society at this point, they uh, have a, uh, a special um, committee that is looking into the issue of uh, multiple comorbidity, and uh, they will be releasing some guidance on uh, how do we manage this? Because when you look out there, what we have are uh, guidance for specific chronic conditions. There is nothing addressing the multi-comorbidity. So what you are asking is exactly this, and I think we are going to learn together. I don't have a good answer uh, at this point. But it's a great question. <laughs> Hi, I just had a quick question about, I think you mentioned something about a voice-activated software. Would that be with the, when the patient talks about his or her limitations or it, and then based on their responses, the, 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 the software asks whatever appropriate question. I don't know. This is the new technology that she's referring. I don't have uh, too much knowledge about it, uh, but I, I believe that it should be uh, the technology we would detect uh, as the patient responds, depending on the type of response, it can generate uh, other types of questions that would go deeper into that issue, particular issue. But I don't have the right knowledge to tell you exactly what it is. Thank you very much, Rosalie. Thank you very much, everyone. It, it, it did occur to me as I, I was listening to this, and it, it already appears to touch a number of uh, departments within HHS and connected departments. It, it should be on the agenda when Nancy organizes the first uh, chronic fatigue syndrome working group uh, w within HHS. Just for your information, this is Nancy Lee. Uh, Rosalie is working out of the office of the secretary in the office on disability. So she is with, she is out of the office, office of the secretary. So she, her office is like sort of 
above office of the assistant or I don't know anyway it's a small but it's a small office yeah it says it's a small office within the immediate office of the secretary yes. and basically our role is a policy role and coordinate efforts across the agency uh, but we uh, it's a really small office and no no funding. Uh, we are not we are not uh, authorized to fund uh, anything. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. The, the next item on the agenda is the Center for Disease Control and Prevention webpage. Uh, and, and given that that's a significant issue and we, we've got a, a break coming up at 10.30, I'm going to propose that we take a, a five-minute break now uh, and convene back here at 10.30 or as close to, to it as we can. Uh, and then we'll, we'll go on to the next topic. So f official five-minute break. Thank you. <laughs>